Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it's Wednesday morning, September 7th, 2022. Hope everybody's doing well today. We are ready for 1 John chapter 2. It's where we are. And we're cross-posted onto the Near Churches page. And as always, on either one of those on Facebook, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to add them in the comment section, and I will address them when I see them. All right, we've got quite a few on so far. Let's see who we've got here. Lyle, good to see you. Roger and Anita, Sheila, Gail, Kiza from Uganda, Anna, Jean, Diana, good to see all of you guys on here today and hope you guys are doing well. First John chapter 2, and that's all I put on the title for the video because I don't know how far we're going to get here. There's so much in First John chapter 2. And so we'll just, uh, we'll see how it goes. And like I said, if you've got a question or comment, feel free to throw it in there, and I'll address it when I see it. So the end of 1 John chapter 1 was dealing with, and we talked about it yesterday, the reality of sin. I mean, you have in, you have in two senses the reality of sin. You have the scriptural reality of sin, okay? I think of, I think it's, let me flip back here real quick. I think it's 1 Kings 8 and verse 46. Uh, Solomon's prayer of praying before the temple and all this as it's being finished and constructed. Yeah, 1 Kings 8, 46. Talking, God's, uh, Solomon's prayer to God about the nation. He says, when they sin against you, and then there's a parenthetical statement, for there is no one who does not sin. So in, in the sense, we, there, there are two senses of the reality of sin. You have the scriptural reality. Okay, scripture declares it's like Paul says in Romans chapter 3 of those under the old law. All Jews and Gentiles, it was concluded that they were under sin, and that's why Christ had to come. So we have that reality. Sharon, watching from Springfield. All right, Miss Sharon, good to see you. But we also have the day-to-day -day experience of life, and we know that none of, not one of us is perfect. We do and say things we know we shouldn't. We violate God's will. And so... As we were ending 1 John chapter 1 yesterday, that's what we were talking about. If we say that we haven't sinned, we're fooling ourselves. So we need to confess our sins, and He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Well, then we jump into chapter 2, where we'll start today. And like I said, I don't know how far we'll get, but we'll just see how it goes. My little children, and so a lot of people grab onto that phrase there in chapter 2 and verse 1, and he uses it throughout this letter um, with the idea, people use that with the idea, well, he's a you know, towards the end of his life, written towards the end of the first century, and he's addressing these Christians as little children. And like I said in the introduction video, that's a possibility. Whatever the case may be, it's a term of endearment, a term of affection. My little children, these things I write to you that so that you may not sin. And notice how it's written there. This is called an aorist subjunctive. I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to sin at all is the idea behind it that you may not sin. But, again, with the scriptural reality and the life experience reality, if anyone does sin, we know that's going to happen. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So a couple things I want to pay attention to here. The advocate. This word in the original language, uh, uh, another way that it's translated in the New Testament is in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, when Jesus is talking to the apostles. You know, he's getting, he's getting ready to leave the earth and go back to the Father. He says, I'm going to send a comforter. And he ta he's talking about the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth. It's the same word. And so for the apostles, upon Jesus' ascension to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to be their advocate. The, the, hey, Michelle, good to see you. The word advocate means one who is called to the side of another. It's like an assistant, a helper, as it's translated in John 14, and I think it's John 14, 26. But that's what Jesus is for us today. I don't want you to sin at all, but if you do sin, you have an advocate. You have, uh, some people express the idea here that, that this is like a lawyer who will plead your case before the judge. Someone who will come to your side and aid you in a difficult time. Well, when we sin, we need that. We need the advocate, and that's Jesus Christ. But then, not only is he an advocate with the Father, 
He pleads our case to God, but notice this here as well. The Father, Jesus Christ, and then he says this, the righteous, the righteous one. Um, There's another verse in the New Testament that deals, well, there are a few, but one that immediately comes to mind is back in Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John are preaching in the temple, and, hmm, I thought it was Acts chapter 3 and verse 18. Ah, here it is, Acts 3 and verse 14. It says, but you denied the Holy One and the just. Well, that's the same word here. He's called, it's translated as righteous in 1 John 2, 1, but in Acts 3, 14, he's the Holy One and the just. Well, that's descriptive of his character. That's, That's what he is. And he's our advocate with the Father when we sin, and he's righteous, he's just, so he'll do what's right in in connection with us in dealing with the Father. But not only that, and that's that's what I said yesterday, the book of 1 John is, is a hopeful and encouraging book. So not only is he an advocate, as it said, not only is he righteous, but now also, John says, he is the propitiation for our sins. So... It, it, it's like it just keeps getting better. Sin's a reality. 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10. We need to confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, when we do sin. And that's not ocular confession to a priest in a little booth somewhere. That's not going to do you any good. We need to confess to the Father. We need to, we're told in James 5, 16 that we confess to one another. So there's, there is that concept of public confession before the church. But you don't have this... Catholic idea of going to a church building and confessing in a booth to a priest somewhere, and then he can absolve us of our sins. That is an unscriptural concept. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. I need to confess my sins to the Father. Well, what does it mean that he is a propitiation for our sins? This word is also used, same word over in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Let me see here. Yeah, it says, And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Well, a propitiation. An easy way to remember what that means is that it's a covering for sin. And it's it's similar to the Old Testament idea of the atonement. All right, read, um, if you want to learn about the Day of Atonement for the Israelites, you can read Leviticus chapter 16 and 17 and the sacrifices that were offered. Well, for us... Okay, like the book of Hebrews says, Jesus is our high priest. He's our great high priest. And he is the propitiation. He is the atonement. Notice this. For our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. His, hey Debbie, Jesus' death, his blood, is sufficient to cover our sins. He's, John's talking to Christians, obviously, but it's also sufficient to cover the whole the, the sins of the whole world. Jesus' sacrificial death, his blood, does not lack any power whatsoever. But John's writing to Christians here, okay? So he's the propitiation for our sins. Now this, 1 John 2 and verse 2 is not saying that everybody's sins are remitted. We know from other passages of Scripture that, you know, there are certain terms that one must meet in order to have his sins remitted or have his sins washed away. But Jesus shed his blood for the whole world. You know, there are, there are a lot of passages that talk about this. Of course, we think of John three sixteen, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Um, I think of Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Well, taste death for every man. Okay, the wages of sin is death. Well, Jesus took that upon himself, died on the cross for us, and he is our propitiation. His death, the shed blood, is what makes the atonement. And a part of this idea here of propitiation and atonement is the idea that what he did appeases the wrath of God. And, you know, when you look at the cross, when you look at what Jesus endured for us on the cross— you see exactly what God thinks of sin. You see his wrath against sin. So like you go back to Isaiah chapter 53. Um, this is a prophetic passage of, it's often called the, the suffering servant. You start reading, and it's the whole chapter, all 12 verses, but it talks about um, 
Let's see. I'll just start in Isaiah 53 and verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yes, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Hey, good morning, Connie. Good to see you. And notice, so Isaiah is writing about 700 years approximately before Christ is even born, and he's spoken, he's spoken, <laughs> he's speaking of these events as if they had already happened. He was this, and he was this. It's, it's like the, um, it, it's so certain that it's going to happen that in the mind of God it has already happened. And I think that's, I think that's an accurate way of assessing this passage. He was oppressed and afflicted, verse 7. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb or silent. So he opened not his mouth. As a sheep led to the shearers. Okay. Um, innocent. I, I think of First Peter chapter one verses eighteen and nineteen. The blood of Christ, um, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He's the perfect sacrifice. He's the sin covering. He's the atonement, the propitiation, as John says here. And what he endured for us satisfied the wrath of God. So, and why did I do that? I already changed from Isaiah 50. I'm going back to Isaiah chapter. I tell you what, I'll just pull it up on the screen here for you uh, since I'm talking about it. Back to Isaiah 53. And you get down here in this text to... Let's see. Verse 10, notice. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You know, there is a very common teaching out there that when Jesus was on the cross and when the sky went dark, that was God turning his back on Jesus because Jesus became sinful. That is not true. Um, of course, people reference, you know, well, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, that's what David said. Yeah, David did say that, you know, Psalm 22 and verse 1. But all you have to do is read the rest of Psalm 22 to see that David was not forsaken. David may have felt forsaken by God. But when you get to Psalm 22, beginning in verse 24, he says, you have not forsaken me. You heard me when I cried. Well, the Lord God did not turn his back on Jesus while Jesus was on the cross. I mean, think about the implication of saying that. Okay, so if Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, which is what Scripture tells us he was, and if, if this is part of the eternal purpose of God, which it was, that, that Jesus would go to the cross and die, then why in the world would God turn his back on his own plan? Why would God have determined this from all eternity, and then when it happens, he doesn't see anything. He just turns his back to it. Notice here in Isaiah 53, verse 11, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. The King James says, He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. What Jesus endured, the suffering he endured on the cross, which is what Isaiah 53 is talking about, satisfied the wrath of God against sin. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And in fact, notice, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, the many doesn't mean, well, just a few. Those who access what was done, you know, we're, we're told, for instance, um, in Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2, that we access the grace of God by faith. And I think that's what we're dealing with here. But, but by knowing him, the righteous servant, that's Jesus, would justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus didn't become a sinner on the cross. He took the guilt of sin and um, uh, paid the price for it, if you, if you want to say it that way. The wages of sin is death. Well, Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And God saw that, and God was satisfied. So we need to be careful um, when we say that God turned his back on his son and on the entire plan of salvation for mankind. 
got a couple comments here. Um, afflicting the innocent and letting go the guilty. Do you believe in penal substitution? I would have to know a good definition of penal substitution. Penal is the idea of punishment, like the, the, the penal system, prison system, punishment, substitution. Um, Jesus was afflicted. Jesus was innocent. But I wouldn't say that he let the guilty go. You know, the, the, the scriptures say a lot of times that he by no means clears the guilty. Um, and, and God punishes sin. There's no question about that. But Jesus took upon himself our sin. Um, it's kind of like second, what is it? Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 20, verse 20 or 21. Let me turn over there real quick. Um, yeah, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, does that mean that Jesus became a sinner? Well, no, that's not what the verse says. It doesn't say that God made him to become a sinner. Again, this is the idea of atonement. This is the idea of uh, propitiation, the sin covering. He didn't become a sinner on the cross, but he suffered... Um, in fact, there in Isaiah chapter 53, it talks about um, he, he, was, he, was, he made his grave with the sinners. He, you know, he was crucified between two malefactors, the Bible tells us. And so to the common eye, well, that's just another criminal hanging on a cross. I mean, the Romans do this all the time. And so to the eyes of many, um, you know, he's, he's as guilty as the, the guys on either side of him. But we know that's not what happened. I mean, th th think about it this way. If Jesus became a sinner, then he deserved to die because the wages of sin is death. All right. So we, we have to be careful in the, in the claims that we make. If he became a sinner, he deserved to die. But, but also you have the flip side of that. One person cannot become a sinner for someone else. Um, read all of Ezekiel chapter 18. Uh, Ezekiel 18 illustrates that by, by laying out three generations of individuals. The father, there, there's this man, he's, he's good, he's just, he does what's right. But then he has a son, and he does the complete opposite of that. And then that evil son has a son, and he's, he does the complete opposite of his own father. He's more like his grandfather. And the point that Ezekiel makes in that chapter is, the soul that sins shall die. And that's the way it works for us. But Jesus took on himself the, the, you might say, the penalty of sin. He died for us. He died in our place. And um, that's the idea of propitiation, the idea of atonement, the idea of appeasing the wrath of God. Because we certainly couldn't do that ourselves um, unless we were just all struck dead. And, and that would have to begin at the garden. But anyway, that's, a, that's kind of another discussion. Sheila says, or, or asks rather, then what did Jesus mean when he asked why the Father had forsaken him? And, and, and in response to that, I think there's, there's some good thought. Hey, Brian, good thought in this. Diana says, I think it showed us his human side for us to see he was also human and was hurting. And, you know, when you think, when you think about Jesus having been on the cross, you know, uh, before he went to the cross, rather, if it is possible, if there's any other way this can be done, what did he pray? Let it be done. And and yet his prayer was, not my will, but your will be done. So why did he say that on the cross? Well, I think we have to appreciate, and what I mean by appreciate is, is um, grasp those around him who heard him say that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I think that, what is that, Matthew 27 and verse 46, and in other passages too, uh, in the parallel accounts. Um, yeah, Matthew 27 and verse 46. So verse 45, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, Gene says, I heard that he was quoting scripture. Well, that's precisely what he was doing, but why was he doing it? I mean, that's word for word, um, Psalm 22 and verse 1, but the question is why? 
Well, those who heard that. And I, I think this is where perhaps we today, you know, modern Bible students, fail. Had we heard that, we probably wouldn't have known the rest of Psalm 22 and what the psalmist wrote about, he heard me when I cried, he's not, how does it say it? He's not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, the afflicted. he has not forsaken me. Those who heard Jesus say that would have known exactly what Psalm 22 said. You and I, we have to Google it. You know, we have to turn our Bibles and find out. We have to read further. Um, you, you think about his disciples who were there. They knew the Old Testament Scriptures, and they knew what Psalm 22 said. David was not forsaken by God. He may have felt forsaken, and perhaps in the moment, um, Jesus as a human was experiencing that. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of even uncomfortable saying that, but whatever the case may be, he quoted from Psalm 22 and verse 1, and we know, as you know, as Paul Harvey used to say, we know the rest of the story. David wasn't forsaken, and Christ wasn't forsaken. It, it's my personal opinion that this was said for the benefit of those around the cross. Okay, so th think about... <clears throat> Well, how would you explain that? Well, think about what Jesus told his apostles in, in Matthew 16. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He's getting ready on the cross to go to Hades, the unseen realm, because he's getting ready to die. And yet he told them, my death, my going to Hades will not prevent the establishment of my church. Um. I, and that goes back to, to us, how would you say it, not being there in the moment, obviously, and not fully understanding everything that they understood. Jesus knew very well that he was not forsaken. And I showed that, you know, from Isaiah chapter 53, particularly Isaiah 53 verses 10 through 12. Um, but it's been explained in the, in the idea of for the benefit of those around he was not forsaken. His death on the cross, you know, to the Romans, you, you put this guy to death and that's the end of this movement. You know, his followers, they're going to see this is the end result of what you're trying to do. The Romans didn't have a conception of him in three days being raised from the dead and the church being established, him ascending to heaven to sit on the right hand of the Father they're just putting another criminal to death. All right, they're they're putting somebody to, de to death who's stirred up the Jews, who in turn has stirred up has stirred up the Romans, and they just want you know they just want everybody to be quiet in Judea. So the best thing we can do is just let's just kill this guy, and this movement will be finished. And that's not the, that that's not at all the case. Um, got a couple more comments here. Uh, maybe him saying, why did this have to happen? And, and I think I see that in the prayers and not, not necessarily questioning why it had to happen. I think he knew exactly why it had to happen. But um, if there's any other way it can happen, you know, let this cup pass from me. Deborah says, if Christ were actually forsaken in the way we, th we think of it, that would mean he deserved what he got and went to hell. And, and Deborah, there are actually people who teach that, that Jesus actually went to hell. Uh, because he became a sinner. Well, if that's the case, then he died separated from God. And I'm not going to make that claim. It's certainly not founded in Scripture. Um, Connie says that she heard a preacher say that God turned his back on Christ. And I, yeah, I'm with you, De uh, Connie. I totally disagree on that. Because it's, it's, it, it runs counter to the divine plan, the, the, the divine scheme of redemption. This is what he came to do. You know, John's gospel says this repeatedly. I came here not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It's like John 5, 30, John 6, 38. And there are several other verses in John's gospel. He knew why he came here. And he, he well, on the cross, he said, it is finished. That's what he came to do. And, um, and he did it. So covered a lot of territory. Two verses. 
He is the propitiation for our sins, the appeasement, the atonement, the sin covering. Uh, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so not only is he the propitiation for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. If people will access his blood by faith, again, Romans 5, 1 and 2, access the grace of God by faith, he can be the propitiation for their sins in reality. It's there. It's kind of like Titus 2 says that um, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, so it's available to everybody, but not everybody avails themselves of it. You have to respond in faith to what God has said and to what God has done. Um, yeah, Diana says even, even David knew God didn't truly turn his back on him. In fact, I just finished writing an article this morning for Think Magazine, uh, Focus Press, and the title of the article is, um, If God Seems Far Away, Who Moved? And I deal in that article a lot with Psalm 22, because people, th people feel that way a lot of times, that God's distant. Well, there may be a reason that he's distant from you, but a lot of times it's just maybe we're having a bad day, and we feel that way. I think David felt that way at times. Doesn't mean it was real. Um... Yeah, Gene says Jesus' physical side knew what terrible things would happen to him. Absolutely. He knew what was coming. Um, Sheila said, what I've heard was not that Christ was sinful, but carrying our sins temporarily separated him from the Father. Well, even if that were the case, and I've heard that, thing, that same thing too, Sheila, that's kind of like a, a mitigation of saying, well, he became a sinner. That's like one step better than him becoming a sinner. Even if that were the case, he deserved to die. Even if he temporarily carried our sins, temporarily separated from God, then he deserved everything he got. And that's just not the case. Not the case at all. All right, guys, we've almost gone 30 minutes. Two verses. Well, uh, to me, there's a lot there. And I appreciate all the interaction here. Um, uh, We've kind of scattered around a variety of verses, but I think that's a good thing to do at times with, some, with, with a thought like this. He's our advocate, he's righteous, and he's our propitiation. There's a lot to that, so I appreciate all the comments and questions. All right, guys, let's, uh, let's stop there for today. We'll come back tomorrow, hopefully, and we will start in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. So hope you all have a good day. And if you're not able to get out tonight, or if you're in a place that doesn't have Wednesday night services, we'll be live here at 7 o'clock Central. And we'll be, uh, we're actually continuing an overview of 1 Timothy. So, anyway. All right, guys. Hope you have a good day, and hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.